this is uh, Sean Galloway, the uh, um, coordinator for the uh, Carroll County Remembers History Project, and I'm here today with Miss Barbara Thompson. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited about the project. No problem. Uh, today's February the 21st, and uh, we're here today to talk to Miss Miss Mrs. Thompson about uh, the area she grew up in and why it was so unique to other places in Carroll County. Uh, could you talk to me a little bit about where you grew up and what was it called? What was it near? Okay. Um, I was born on McKinstry Mills Road in 1947. Little did I know that it was the same house that my dad was born in. Um, McKinstry Mills Road uh, was predominantly an African American community. Of course, when I was born and as a little girl, we called ourselves colored. Um, it was a pretty much segregated community. Um, there was one white family that lived um, off of the road um, in a big, huge house that, of course, didn't reflect uh, my reality. Uh, my reality was poverty. Uh, but then, of course, you know, Sean, I, I didn't look at, at myself or our family as poor because when, when I look around, um, just about all the people on that road were on basically the same socioeconomic status. However, um, I think we were at the bottom of that totem pole. Um, I grew up in a house with, with no indoor um, running water. Uh, I, th I think we finally got the indoor uh, cold running water when I was, I don't know, maybe in my early teens. We had no um, indoor plumbing, so we had an outhouse. Um, I was one of seven children. I'm third from the, the youngest. Um, the community, though, was a, was a very close, cohesive community. Uh, everyone knew each other. Um, all the parents took responsibility for, for the other children on that road. Um, and so that, that whole sense of, of, of community and community involvement was there. Um, my first, my first educational experience was at Robert Moton School, which was the then segregated school in Carroll County, and my Uncle Dan, um, my, my dad's brother, drove the bus that, that, uh, took the children to, to this segregated school miles away and passed a number of schools that we could have attended, but because it was the law of the land. Segregation was the law of the land. So, so my, my life experience, my, my early life experience growing up on McKinstry Mills Road, now that I look back, was, um, it was good. I mean, we, we created our own fun. We, we, we respected older people. We couldn't call adults by their first name. The expectation was, you call that adult Mr. You call that adult Miss. Um, likewise, the, the adults had pretty rigorous uh, rules for the children. You know, when adults would be gathering, you'd better not try to interrupt the conversation. <laughs> and, and, and talk talk about, well, I need to do this, or I want to go this place, I want to go that place. So um, looking back, it, it just, those memories are warm. Those memories are, 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 are good. And, and, and not until, not until desegregation came did, did life as I know it change. And what, what happened with desegregation? How did your life change that way? Ooh. Now, I, I can only speak for me. Uh -huh. I can only speak for me because I think that that, that whole experience for everyone that lived on McKinstry Mills Road was different. Um, first of all, I need to share some, 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 a few personal things. Okay. Um, I, once again, I was one of seven children. My mom... My mom was a domestic worker, which was the norm 
for a lot of the African American women of that time. She worked in rich white folks' homes for minimal salary. My dad, um, who whose history I traced uh, back to the 1700s, um, my dad was not your normal everyday dad that got up and went to work and provided for his children. And unfortunately, my dad suffered with the disease of alcoholism. So, so in a family of seven with a mom that worked two, three, four, sometimes five jobs, and a dad who, who, for whatever reasons, his, that was the basis of his alcoholism, didn't, we struggled. We struggled. And, and I internalized a lot of that struggle. So, so, the, so the, the change, the, 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 the changes that took place in my life when desegregation came about, probably impacted me a lot differently than others. You will, you probably will talk with others that lived on McKinsey's Mills Road that went transition into that whole de desegregation era with, well, I didn't really have a problem. You might hear them say that. I had lots of problems. I had some emotional issues going into desegregation. All that being said, I developed school phobia. Why? I developed school phobia. I, oh, why? Went to Elmer Wolf School, entering the seventh grade. Here I was at the onset of puberty. So, you know, you mix that up with all the stuff that was going on in my home. Enter a whole new phase. And it was obvious that those white folk did not want us at Elmer Wolf. They did not. There was so much anger. The teachers didn't want us there. Um, I went from being a very smart, accomplished, goal-oriented girl, black girl, to an underachieving, scared, mixed up black girl. Um, at Robert Moton, I soared. I was at the top of my class, along with many others. There are lots of black, smart black kids at Robert Moton. So what? But, but oh, I'm sorry, so, go ahead. So um, what, what was it that, that made, took you from uh, an overachiever to an underachiever? What was the difference? Was it the, uh, the teachers cared more at Robert Moton about your education or what? It was, it was a combination of things, yes. Those teachers at Robert Moton really did truly care. Those teachers at Robert Moton kept in touch with your parents. They, 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 the discipline, the, the, the whole, that, that whole, and, it, and sometimes it was unspoken. Yes, you can do it. Yes, you can achieve. Okay? At Robert Moton. Transitioning into the desegregated schools, kid, teachers didn't want us there. The other kids didn't want to sit. Kids didn't, didn't even want to sit beside you. The white kids didn't even want to sit beside you. They somehow thought if they touched you that your, your skin color was going to rub off on them. You know, there was, a, there was an, an atmosphere of hatred there. Um, there was an atmosphere of, oh, you're a color girl. What do you know? You know, you don't know the answers. You know, I'll never forget. Um, um, there was one such incident, I was in a math class, and um, of course we had to raise our hand if we knew the answer. One particular teacher, I had my hand up and he would refuse to call on me. Now, once again, I'm, I'm 12 years old. I'm 12 years old. Um, I didn't have the ability to work through that. I didn't have the ability to say, well, you know what, that's how he grew up. That's all he knows. He thinks I am worthless. I didn't, ha I, I didn't have that inside me. So what it did, it created in me doubts and fears. And well, maybe I'm not smart. You know, may maybe I'm not as smart as I thought I was. Maybe I'm not um, a good person. Maybe... I shouldn't be here in this school. Maybe I can't measure up to, to these white kids. 
How did you overcome all that? You know, Sean, I don't even know whether I ever have. Not fully. Not fully. That, 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 that whole sense of not good enough impacted me for many, 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 many years. Um, and I, I've had to actively work on that through my first marriage, through having my children through this marriage that I am in now, um, that whole not good enough stuff. Um, my other siblings, though, seem to, my younger, I have two younger siblings, Paul and Lois. Um, they, though, somehow were able to maneuver through that and without being impacted to the degree that I was. But I truly believe that we were all impacted by, by the, the racism of that era. Okay. Oh, did you have anything more? Well, I, I, just, I simply just wanted to say that I didn't know how poor I was. Mm -hmm. You know? Right. And, and until, until um, I went to a desegregated school, and I would hear kids talking about things like taking vacations to the beach. I'm like, to the beach? The only time I've ever seen the beach is in picture books, you know? Right. Um, I look at the way they were dressed. And I look down at what I would have on. And I go, oh, wow, I'm really not like them. You know? And, 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 and I don't blame, I don't blame anyone for that experience. It was just, that's just the way it was. That's just the way it was. The fact that my clothes weren't as nice, my shoes had holes in the bottom, uh, my hair was different. You know, so, so of course, when the 60s came about and black became proud, <laughs> that's when I was able to start working through, start, start, started learning more and more and more about my own history because in that desegregated school, I, I learned nothing about my history. Mm -hmm. You know, that wonderful, proud history. That, that we have, that we have, that we have come from. Okay. Now, uh, talking about your history, um, can you tell me about the area of Priestland? Oh, you know, now there again, I, I, I think that, that the area of McKinstry Mills Road and then the, then the road that was like perpendicular to McKinstry Mills Road, I think people called that whole area Priestland. There were times that people said, oh, you're, you're from Priestland. Um, the actual road that's called Priestley, my Uncle Dan, my, my dad's brother, lived in a, in a tiny house that he built with his own two hands, by the way. Lived in a house on the corner of Priestland and, and McKinstry Mills Road. Um, way back in the 1800s. Um, my, my family, the Jones family, migrated to McKinstry Mills Road from an area called the Ridge. On the Ridge was a house that housed multiple generations of Joneses, a blacksmith shop, and a one-room schoolhouse. And I have corroborated that by finding uh, a, a map of that area from 1873. To this day, we're not, sh we're not quite sure. We've never done a land search. We pretty much assumed that that land was lost to taxes. But even back then, my, my family were, were free colored people. They migrated then to, to the, the land known as McKinstry Mills Road, built a blacksmith shop. Um, and that blacksmith shop was known throughout Carroll County. Why? Um, oh. My grandfather, Deronda Jones, and his father, Joseph Jones, were the best. They were the best blacksmiths. And they, they people came from miles around to uh, have their horses shoed and, 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 and have their wagon wheels repaired and, and all of those kinds of things that, that, that are done 
uh, in a blacksmith shop. And many times people didn't have money to pay them. Um, so they, they bartered. They would bring chickens in exchange for payment, or eggs, a ham, whatever, you know? It, there was not always an exchange of money. And on McKinstry Mills Road, everyone knew, they called my, my great-grandfather Pap Pap Joe. I grew up hearing about Pap Pap Joe, and I was like, okay, now this man's related to me, but I'm not quite sure how he is. Um, he, he was he a was, uh, pretty tall guy, dark skin. I understand that um, he was very soft-spoken, you know. He had a son named Deronda, who was my grandfather. Deronda um, learned the art of blacksmithing from the time he was a little boy. He married Beatrice Matthews, Anna Beatrice Matthews, and gave birth to my Uncle Dan, and then gave birth to my dad, Moses Jones. And I just want to interject something here. Okay. You know, I grew up Catholic, so it was like, why in the world would anybody name their child Moses? And I found out after I did some a lot of research that my dad was named after his great great grandfather. So, yeah. so now it's, I'm proud. <laughs> okay, so um, you know um, the, that entire area, uh, Priestland, uh, Kendrick Mill Road, it's been there. I mean, 1800s, yeah. easy. Um, in your research of the area, what are some of the things that you were able to find out? Some of the things you were able to dig up about about that area. Okay, um, there at, at the at the end of the road, and I'm not quite sure going in which direction, but at the end of that road is a mill. Um, where where grain was was processed, and and and. To my knowledge, there was a family by the name of Zumbrum who owned that mill. And, and for whatever reason or reasons, obviously they, their sense of interactions with colored people were a little different. Maybe, I don't know, who knows? Maybe they at some point were maybe even abolitionists. I'm not sure because I, I don't know that. But one of the gentlemen, one of the gentlemen in that family actually taught my grandfather how to play the violin and how to uh, play the organ. Um, so I think there was a, more of a sense of acceptance in our little corner of the world, in our own little corner of the world, even, even, even back during during that, those times. Now, my, my grandfather, Deronda, died in 1918 from the influenza epidemic. How old was he? He was 27. And I, ha I have many pictures of him. He was just a fine-looking gentleman. And, um, and I, I, I think also that the blacksmith shop afforded my family of course, way before I was born, afforded my family certain amenities because the pictures I have of him, he's in a suit and a tie, or he's, you know, playing his violin. So, and, and then the, the people that migrated, the black people that migrated to that road were, were very respectful. Of, of my family and, 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 and looked up to them because of, of the skills that, that, they, that they had. Okay. Uh, can you tell me a little bit, uh, we talked a little bit yesterday about a trail that was in uh, your backyard. Could you tell me about that? Yeah. You know, by the time I was born and, and, and was able to articulate and uh, um, talk and question, down on the lower end of our yard was just a pile of logs, big old pile of logs. And there was a road, there was like a little trail that led up to this pile of logs, up to the hill. And I asked my mom one day, well, why doesn't anybody move that pile of logs? And she said, well, I don't know, that was the old shop. The shop. <laughs> so I was like, okay, you know? And then as I got a little older, I would ask, a, a few more questions, and she would tell me that when she married my dad, 
she moved into the house and there lived his grandfather who by that time was suffering from dementia he was blind um, but my mom also talks about how the people on the road were just there was just such a closeness there was such an atmosphere of okay we're all in this together you know we're gonna love each other and support each other and respect each other even way back then when she was a young mom having her children but uh, that shop and I look back now and I'm like I wish I would have had the wherewithal to at least take a picture of that big old pile of logs because that's that's a part of my history uh, tell me about your brothers and sisters and uh, some of the people that you grew up with in that area. Okay. All right. Um, I'm third from the youngest. Um, under me is my brother, Paul. And um, Paul probably is um, one of the more well-known Joneses. Um, he just so happened to, to uh, marry Jada Pickett Smith's mom which makes him the father-in-law to, to Will Smith, the actor. And so, and, and, and Paul absolutely does not want to be known as such. He doesn't, because my brother, despite all that we went through, was able to pull himself up by bootstraps that he, when he didn't even have boots, went to Morgan State, got his degree, um, just, and he didn't sail to the top of corporate America. He got there with all the knowledge and all the determination that he needed. And he, and he went to the top and has become a wonderful person just all by himself. So his connection to that celebrity, that's, that whole celebrity family, is not who he is. And that's what I love about him. That's what I love about him. And, and, and all the good stuff that was put in him by my mom and the community on McKinstry's Mills Road is still there today. Then I have a younger sister named Lois. Lois um, is, is a, a registered nurse and has many other uh, initials behind her name. Lois probably should have been a doctor. She's very bright and, and specializes in geriatrics and is on now on the administrative end um, of, of nursing. Um, I have two sisters that are deceased, um, Elizabeth and Mary Louise. Um, and, but they too, they were, I miss them to this day. I, we were just so close. And, and then I have a brother named Thomas who retired from um, Lehigh Portland Cement Company. Um, and then I have a sister named Rose who lives in Chicago, Illinois. Actually, she lives in Long Drive. Um, uh, well, it's in the suburbs of, of Chicago. Um, and she, she's a librarian. So as you can see, that, that poverty, you know, it, it's like we, we took it. And we were able to rise above it. Um, and I'm so proud of my brothers and sisters. I am so proud of from who I came. I'm proud of the fact that I had a dad named Moses Jones who growing up, even though he was a very dysfunctional alcoholic, I, I'm thinking, well, I would have never, ever, ever even begun to research his history on McKinn Street Mills Road if I had not been curious as to why he turned out the way he did. How long have you been uh, putting this research in? For, for okay, I, I started um, researching my dad's uh, genealogy that way back in 1977. I, I was fortunate to attend a lecture by Alex Haley uh, who wrote that phenomenal book called Roots. He, he was giving a presentation 
at a at a local college in 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 Frederick called Hood, and it happens to be the same college that my husband got his psychology degree from. But that's just a little aside thing. <laughs> um, and I was sitting there, pregnant with my second child, thinking I was fascinated. I I held onto his every word, and I was thinking, oh, I could do that. I could do that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to start tonight. And I went home and I called my sister. And I said, Rose, I just heard Alex Haley speak. And from that, from that moment on, Alex Haley ignited that spark in me to, to, to trace my, my family history. I have since, and I, and I bought the manuscript with me, I have since put it in manuscript form. I have receipts from the old blacksmith shop and I have pictures, I have all kinds of memorabilia that hopefully I'll pass on to one of my grandchildren when I'm no longer here. And is, that is the hope for all of this, uh, you know, yes. that is the hope for all this, for all the uh, hard work that you put in since 1977, a yes. very, very long time. Yes, yes, and, and I am proud of it, and, 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 and I'm at the point now, Sean, that I'm wondering, okay, other than, other than what do I do with this? Now, now that I have it in manuscript form, I have, I have my mom's genealogy and I have my dad's genealogy, but of course, they're intertwined. You know, my, my mom loved my dad, despite all of his imperfections. She loved him. Um, so their, their stories are intertwined. And once again, she came to live in the old house on McKinstry Mills Road, at a time where there were multiple generations living in that house. So she became entrenched in that whole Jones legacy. Um, so um, I'm hoping that one day I can share um, my manuscripts with other people that have done either their genealogy or people that are interested in, in black history. Um, I don't, I, I don't want to just keep it to myself. I just don't want to keep it in the family. My hope, of course, is to maybe somehow, not even necessarily have it published for the public, but somehow put it in some kind of book form that I can share with other people. Okay. Uh, what are some of the success stories outside of the family for everybody that, for some of the people that you know uh, that grew up in that area? Let me tell you. Yeah. Okay. I was so busy bragging about my family. <laughs> Um, let's see. A couple of years ago, several years ago, we did a uh, McKenna Street Mills Road reunion. Actually, it was like a Union Bridge reunion because you know, McKenna Street Mills Road is, 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 is a road that is like the suburb of the little town of, of Union Bridge. Mm -hmm. I was amazed, Sean. I was amazed. And, uh, and I'll, I'll just speak now on McKenna Street Mills Road. Okay. Okay. Uh, all of the success stories. You know, we have a um, person who became um, a colonel in, 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 in the military, a person uh, who is the, the dean of the business school at Clark Atlanta University. We have nurses and social workers, and you name the profession, that's what came out of McKinstry's most road. And, and, and I am in awe, and I think that we all are, those of us that grew up, among, in all that poverty. We even ask ourselves, wow, what was it that, that kind of like elevated us to a status of, you know what, I can do that. Um, certainly, um, I, I look at them, it, all of these wonderful professions. And when we come together, Sean, these, if I run into someone, it's like it takes us back and there's still the same love. There's still the same respect. There's still the same mutual, hey, we, we, we were able to rise above that, all of that stuff. Yeah. So there's, you know, just amazing professions that, that came out of that. 
um, for from all the uh, the, the uh, poverty, all the poverty that you guys withstand. Um, is there any other way or any other place that you would have rather grown up? Absolutely not. Why is that? Now, if, if, if you would have asked me that while I was growing up there, I would have said, oh, let, let me go live in one of those big houses where my mom scrubs the floors and, 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 and changes diapers to these little screaming little white kids. and Oh, then put me in one of those houses. Put me in one of those houses. If you would have asked me that. I don't think I would be who I am. I don't know that I would have even begun to research the genealogy of my mom and dad. Had I grown up in a privileged environment, I don't know. I don't think so. So I think growing up in that area gave me and all those others that grew up in that area a sense of we have a rich legacy. You know, no one gave us the 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 that stuff that 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 was placed inside of us by our parents or by the community. It was there. It was there for us. It was there. So had, had we all grown up in a different, more privileged environment, I don't know. I, I don't know that any of us would be where we are. Uh, how, how is the area of the Priestland area different today than it was back then? Oh. So many have gone on to be with the Lord. Our, the house I grew up in is just a shell. There was a fire there many, many, many years ago. And the owner of the property, because we never owned that house, by the way. The owner of the property has chosen to leave it just stand, and it's probably fallen in on itself. There are so few people, so few families that are still there now. Um, how new houses have sprung up. It is no longer a predominantly black community. Um, it, it's, it's changed a lot. But I love to drive down there. In fact, when I leave here today, I'll probably take a little detour and drive up there because I, I get very nostalgic just seeing that house. How important is it to preserve the memory of, of Priestland? Uh, not just from when you were growing up there, but all the way back to the 1800s, traced back to its beginnings. How important is that? Oh, it is so important. I think it's, I, 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 I think that we owe it to the next generation, generation after that, to, to, to keep it in front of them, keep it in front of us. All the struggles and the, Heartaches and the, the 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 just just hard work that our ancestors that that our our, our ancestors strive to be the best that they could in an atmosphere of a country that saw them as less than. I think it's important for our children and for our grandchildren and all the generations to come to know that. This is your legacy. Don't use excuses like, I'm poor, I don't have a mom, or I don't have a dad, or I, I, I don't have the money, or, you know, and I could just go on and on and on, you know, because excuses come a dime a dozen, you know, and I think it's important to recognize what our ancestors did for us. It's important to know that we stand on their shoulders. Just as our children and grandchildren will stand on our shoulders. They stand on the shoulders of all of those people that came before them. And they can stand tall and be proud of who they are. Uh, is, there, is there anything that you, else that you would like to add? The only thing I would like to add is that um, 
if anyone that, that watches this interview, if, you, if by chance you're, you're interested in Joan's legacy, you know, you, you certainly can contact me. Um, I can share a copy of, of, of all of the information that I have gathered over the years. Uh, eventually, I would like to um, put a copy of, of, of my manuscripts at the Carroll County Public Library and the Historical Society. I look forward to that. Oh, one, one more really quick thing. Are the, for those that are interested in Priestland and the, the whole McKendrick's Mill Road area, um, what are some, some uh, are there any standing um, landmarks uh, today that anybody could go there and, and probably recognize from you talking about in this interview today? You know what? I don't think so. Other than the, once again, our house still stands. My Uncle Dan, his house still stands. He died back in, I think, 2005. Um, there, there's a house that doesn't exist anymore. There's a lady by the name of Miss Lucille Black. Uh, she and my mom were really, really close. And, and um, uh, her house is, was right down the road from ours. Uh, her house no longer stands. Um, the Davis house still stands. But, but if you're asking, is there like a plaque? Or is there something tangible that you could see or touch now? Should there be? Yes, there should. Yes. And you know, I am so glad you, you brought that up. I, I think that that's something that maybe those of us that grew up on that road maybe need to look into and, and, and um, you know, explore that possibility. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate you taking the time out, and like I said, uh, I think we just barely scratched the surface on this interview, uh, so hopefully we can get, get you out, talk to you again um, sometime soon. Thank you so much, Sean. All right. It was a pleasure. Thank you.